All right, good afternoon, everybody. Let's get started with the class. So for announcements uh, this week or this Monday, um, be sure to take a look. Uh, there's an assignment, homework assignment posted on Canvas. Take a look at that homework too. That is due this Friday. Also take a look at uh, the lab one due date. If you have not uh, submitted that, uh, make sure you get that in by the, the due date and the due time. This Friday, we will start lab two. So we will continue on your project, get your motor running, continue with the motor driver circuit. So I will see you in lab this Friday. So from the last class, um, we covered uh, analysis and uh, a review of analysis and circuit theory. And so I wanted to continue with that topic this class. And actually, I think we're going to finish up with the review this class. So we've spent about three lectures on review. And then we'll move on to um, some material on electrical test and measurement. So you can continue on and have some, have some information while you're doing the measurements on your project in lab. Uh, so last class, we covered wire gauge and power loss due to wires. We applied Ohm's law. And we talked about capacitors and removing noise from uh, power, uh, power lines or uh, power traces, power wires and signal traces and uh, using decoupling capacitors to do that. So for this class, what I want to do is start uh, with inductors. So let's do that. So you've covered inductors in physics, I'm sure, and maybe in your intro circuits class, but I want to uh, present maybe something you haven't seen yet. So an inductor is a coil of wire that uh, when you run current through that coil of wire, a magnetic field is created, and that is the mechanism uh, through which energy is stored. So the schematic symbol looks like this, as always, as typically. We define current into the positive side of voltage, and I have time varying voltage and current drawn here. And so the relationship between voltage and current is this, V is equal to L di dt. Okay, so what that means is that uh, uh, voltage is zero when I of t is dc. In other words, when I of t is a constant value, because the derivative of that constant value would be zero, the voltage is zero. Okay, and the voltage is only non-zero when I of t is time varying. Okay, so one function uh, that you could view an inductor doing is allowing DC to pass easily through that inductor because there's no voltage through that inductor. And as the frequency of, let's say, a sinusoid increases, uh, that um, a voltage is created across that inductor because the derivative of that current passing through the inductor um, uh, increases and you get a voltage. Okay, so an inductor tends to allow DC to pass and block AC currents. You could see that a little more clearly if you represent the inductor with an inductive impedance. So if I define a phasor voltage and a phasor current for this inductor that I'm now calling Z sub L, um, an, an impedance that represents that inductor, um, then you can relate voltage to current with V equals IZ, right? where V and I are the phasors representing voltage and current, and Z is the inductive impedance, or just an impedance. And the impedance is J omega L. Okay, And so the impedance of an inductor increases with frequency. That you can see right here, that the magnitude of the impedance increases uh, with frequency omega. So here are some common types of inductors. Here is a, uh, an air core inductor. So you can wind inductors pretty easily. You take wire, usually what they call magnet wire. It has some enamel on it for an, ins uh, an insulator. You can wind that inductor with an air core. You can put in an, uh, an iron core or a ferrite core and, and wind your own or, or buy them. Um, these are typically small and uh, low cost. They can be small. They can be large, but but uh, typical inductors are small and low cost that look like this. Another type of inductor structure that you will see is a toroid. So this, uh, 
this coil of wire that's wrapped in this well toroid shape is wrapped around a core. And so there's a um, probably a ferrite core in there, um, increasing the inductance per turn of, of that inductor. Okay, so those toroids have high inductance per turn. So if you need a big inductor or big inductance, uh, you can use a toroid to do that. Of course, there's a weight penalty there because, well, um, you're adding material instead of wrapping the coil around air. There are surface mount inductors. So here's a surface mount inductor. You can see the terminals on the bottom of this one here. Um, they can have what's sometimes times called a, a bobbin core here. Um, so there's a surface mount inductor. And you can mount those directly on printed circuit boards. Uh, there are also for, uh, for through hole printed circuit boards, axial inductors that look like this. And so you can buy those instead of buying, uh, winding them yourselves or buying a, um, an inductor that looks like this solenoid up top. All right. And so when you select, uh, uh, and I should say inductor, when you select a, an inductor, um, consider the inductance value and tolerance. Sometimes inductors don't have the best uh, uh, tolerance. You can get them higher tolerances or good tolerances, but often not so much. But you can adjust you can adjust the inductance value when you have an air core by spreading the coils or, or pushing them together. You also have to consider the uh, the frequency at which you're operating to make sure the core can handle uh, that um, that frequency. And also, in between these coils, there's actually a capacitance formed because you have metal separated from another piece of metal by an insulator, and that's a capacitor. So at high frequencies, this capacitor can be the capacitance can become significant. And you have to consider loss characteristics. So the loss of the wire, the ohmic loss, and also the loss of the the core. All right. And also you have to consider impact on size and weight. So if you're using a lot of big toroids, your product could be heavy. All right. Okay. So common applications of inductors are electrical filters. So electrical filters select signals within a passband um, and remove signals outside of that passband. Okay. So if you have some noise or signals you don't want uh, in your wire, in your transmission line, um, you can use a filter to reject those signals. Here's an example of a of an, a filter that uses two air core inductors that were tuned by spreading the uh, the coils out and um, just to the right right amount when using some measurement equipment to determine if I have the passband right. So you have capacitors and inductors here to form a filter. You can create oscillators. Um, which create either a sinusoidal waveform or a square wave, right? Here's an example of a voltage controlled oscillator. It's a tuned circuit that probably has um, an, an inductor. Um, and then uh, DC to DC converters, which we will cover, right? DC to DC converters that we will cover, uh, use inductors to, to create a higher DC voltage or a lower DC voltage than the source. So this is the one you have in your kit. And so this is the inductor right here on this DC to DC converter board. And someone asks, uh, what, what, let's see in the chat, um, what's the, what are the filter inductors coded in? That's actually hot glue. Um, that is, this was a fairly low frequency filter. So, so uh, you know, it didn't have to be a certain dielectric um, or, or magnetic property uh, coding on it. So that's just, that's just hot glue there. You can do, use things like, um, uh, polythio, you can use RTV, you can use uh, sometimes super glue to hold these together. But um, uh, what else would be used? Uh, really, really any material, but you have to be careful about high frequency filters because they will see that coating um, as either a dielectric or, or possibly a magnetic influence there. Okay, and so each application functions based on this I versus V relationship, V equals L D I D T. That's, that's fundamental for inductors. You create filters, you create oscillators, you convert DC because of this relationship. So that will keep showing up as we talk about any circuit with inductors, including motors. Okay. 
Um, so let's see. Uh, here's, here's an example. Here's a filter example. So here's a simple circuit with an inductor and a capacitor uh, that forms a bandpass filter. So here's a source, right, in blue on the left. Here's a load, resistive load on the right. And in the middle, this single inductor, 10 millihenries and 0.1 microfarad capacitor, that, that forms a filter. Okay, so, uh, and this is a bandpass filter, which uh, passes signals around a center frequency. Okay, rejects signals outside that. And so here is the frequency response of that filter. So this filter allows a selection of a desired frequency um, and rejects signals uh, outside of a certain frequency band called the pass band. Okay, so you can reject signals and you can reject noise. Uh, so if you look at this characteristic here, right, this green line, this is uh, v in divided by, uh, I'm sorry, V out divided by V in, right, in, in phasor form. So, so if I take V out phasor divided by V in phasor, I get H of F, which is the frequency response. If I take the magnitude, then I'm relating the amplitudes of output versus input and forgetting about the phase because I'm taking just the amplitude. So what this shows is on, let's see, the horizontal axis frequency in Hertz, and the, on the vertical axis, this is the frequency response, which is V out over V in magnitude. Um, and so you can see right here at around five kilohertz, I, ha I have H of F magnitude equals one. That means the output amplitude of the sinusoid at five kilohertz equals the input. The signal passes right through. As I have signals that would deviate from five kilohertz, you can see their output gets attenuated Right, because output versus input goes down, they get those signals get rejected, and uh, the filter stops or lessens the amplitude of those signals. Right, so we usually define a pass band. So the the vertical pink dotted lines show the pass band. Right, and this happens to be 0 0.707 right here, the half power of voltage. 0 0.707 squared is one half. Um, so that's the ha those are the half power points. Um, so we consider within those half power points, signals will pass. You know, that's about what a little less than a one kilohertz bandwidth. And then outside of those cutoff frequencies, um, we consider signals to be rejected. So that that takes an inductor, right? Uh, to do that, to make this kind of bandpass filter in, in this circuit topology. And you can actually, uh, cascade LC sections um, and make sharper roll-offs, wider bandwidths. You can define the bandwidth and the roll-off and the, the um, how much signals are rejected at certain frequencies. And so this was an example of a filter design tool uh, that designed this filter with this frequency response. You can see it has a nice flat pass band to pass some signals within that finite bandwidth and a really steep roll-off to reject low frequency signals, okay? Um, so what are, what are the advantages, someone asks, what are the advantages to using an inductor rather than using a combination of just resistors and capacitors to make filters? Think of it this way, if there's a volt, so the answer is loss, okay? Um, that's one big answer. You, you don't want resistors in your filter if you're trying to have low loss through that filter for the desired signals. If there's a voltage across a resistor, even AC, or a current through a resistor, DC or AC, that resistor is dissipating power as heat. So the signal that you wanted to pass through, maybe cleanly not get rejected at all, will have some rejection if you have resistors in your filter, okay? There may be resistors elsewhere in your circuit, but if you don't want loss in your filter, don't use resistors. Um, also, uh, you know, there are some active op amp filters where you might be able to do this, but for a passive structure, for a passive filter, um, you would need uh, an inductor and a capacitor to make a, a band pass response, right? You can make a high pass response and a low pass response with only a capacitor or only an inductor, but to get this kind of um, bandpass response, you need a capacitor and an inductor in your circuit or more than one of each. Okay.
All right. Uh, so this tool I recommend, this is a free tool I've been using since the 1990s that is still good, still free. Um, it's called LT Spice, and you can get lots of circuit models for it. Right? It's a circuit simulation tool. So if you're interested in circuit simulation, you want to play with the, you know, this kind of circuit or whatever circuit you're working on, uh, download LT Spice. Just search the web for LT Spice. You'll see it show up. <clears throat> okay, let's do a clicker here. Um, so I'm going to walk you through a problem. And this is all about power delivered to an inductor. So let's find the average power delivered to an inductor from a sinusoidal source. So here's a sinusoidal current source. It might be just some circuit that's supplying a current to this inductor. And you want to know um, for this 0.3 microhenry inductor, how much power is delivered on average uh, to this inductor, right? So uh, the relationship between voltage and current for an inductor is V equals L di dt, right? We saw that. Okay, so let's, let's, let's do this. Let's, you know, figure out the voltage. We know the current through the inductor. Let's figure out the voltage so we can calculate power. So L is 0.3 times 10 to the negative sixth. And then di dt is the derivative with respect to time of 10 sine 10 to the 6t. That's just the source. So that's this, right? You take the derivative of 10 sine 10 to the 6t and you get 10 to the 6 cosine 10 to the 6t, right? Times 10, the original amplitude of the sine, times the inductance. And so you get a voltage that has an amplitude of three volts and it's a cosine, it's no longer a sine, right? Same frequency, but phase shifted by 90 degrees. So that, so an inductor, the voltage across an inductor is going to be 90 degrees phase shifted compared to the, the current through it. And right? you can see sine versus cosine. Okay. So let's calculate instantaneous power. Instantaneous power is point by point in time, right? Uh, what is the power given a time domain current and a time domain voltage? And then from that, you can calculate average power, right? Average power for a periodic waveform, you can, you can integrate uh, that waveform for one period and then divide by that period. And that gives you the average of that time domain variable, which is power here. Okay, so let, let, me, let me walk you through some plots of this so you can do this without writing any equations. So here is current versus time, current on the vertical, time on the horizontal in microseconds there. So you see a, a sine wave, right? That's 10 sine, 10 to the 6t. And then here is voltage. That's the voltage we calculated from uh, V equals L di dt. And you can see the 90 degrees phase shift, right? Here's a cosine versus the sine current. You multiply these together point by point, okay? And you get this. You get, you get another sinusoid. And if you remember your trig identity, even if you don't remember your trig identities, you would see now that the frequency is, is twice that of the sine and the cosine, okay? And the amplitude is half of their amplitudes multiplied together, but it doesn't matter. You get this uh, instantaneous power for the inductor. Okay, so just looking at that, right? Um, what, I just started the clicker, so what, I uh, didn't yet, let's do that now. What is the average power delivered to the inductor if this is the instantaneous power that is clearly periodic? So take, uh, take 30 seconds and answer that question. All right, if you don't, if you haven't answered, take a guess to get your credit. Okay, and I'll call time now. Okay, so, um, right, the, here's zero watts right here. And when power is positive, when you use I times V with the passive reference configuration, any positive power goes into the inductor, it's absorbed, it's, 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 
it's absorbed, I say, by the inductor, but it's delivered to the inductor and it's stored in some way. And then negative power is taken out of the inductor. So energy is going in, energy is coming out. So here the, the inductor is taking in energy and power at uh, below zero, it's supplying power. So what's happening here is look at the first half cycle, right? You have power going into the inductor. The, the magnetic field is growing. That magnetic field is growing, right? Power in, um, energy in until you hit zero again, and then energy power comes out, right? And so right here you have taken you've taken energy uh, in, you've given equal amount of energy out, and every cycle you do that, you put energy in, you take energy out, right? Say power and energy interchangeably here because power is just the rate of transfer of energy. Okay, so, so you put some energy in, you take some energy out, you put some energy in, you take some energy out. So that's what an inductor is doing. An ideal inductor is you're, you're, you know, you're never delivering time average power to an inductor for a periodic waveform, okay? So that's why there's filters. When I talked about the, the inductor and the filter, right, in theory, it's lossless. So it's taking energy in, it's giving energy back, but there's no loss. In reality, wires have some loss, right? The, um, the, the uh, uh, ferrite or the iron core of the inductor might have some, some loss. It heats up a little bit, so you do get some loss. But that's not what an inductor is used for. The, that's, that's a bad... Um, consequence of a real inductor, but what you typically use an inductor for is, is um, you know, s storing energy maybe temporarily, um, or, uh, or for its V equals L D I D T characteristic. But you're not delivering power to that inductor. Okay. All right. So the answer is D zero zero watts. Okay. And again, if you have any questions as I go through this material, um, shout them out, shoot them in the chat. Um, and also see the review videos that I have posted if you want to strengthen any of these uh, knowledge points. Okay, more review, Kirchhoff's current law. Right, you've seen this probably a couple times. Let's just review it because I have a couple practical um, examples where Kirchhoff's law is important. So if you have a node, so this green section of wire is a node. A node is the entire connection between circuit elements. Um, and if I define some currents, right, then KCL, Kirchhoff's current law, can be expressed in three ways. They all result in the same equation. The sum of currents entering a node is zero. Right, so I have I1 entering, I3 entering. I chose these directions at random. I2 is leaving, but negative I2 is entering. Right, I4 is leaving, but negative I4 is entering. So I can sum all of the entering currents, I1 plus negative I2 plus I3 plus negative I4. I set that sum equal to zero. You've got a KCL equation. Uh, KCL can also be expressed as the sum of currents leaving a node is zero, right? So I1 is entering, but negative I1 is leaving. I3 is entering, negative I3 is leaving, okay? So I sum these currents leaving negative I1 plus I2 plus negative I3 plus I4. I get the same equation as equation number one here, multiply both sides by negative one. And the, sum, uh, the third way is the sum of currents entering a node equals the sum of currents leaving a node. Okay, so I1 plus I3 equals I2 plus I4. Right, so that's KCL. Okay. Kirchhoff's voltage law, if I have some circuit, and it doesn't matter what these circuit elements are, A, B, C, and D. If I have these four circuit elements. I have a couple terminals here. I defined some voltages across those circuit elements. I randomly chose the polarities. So some of those voltages might be positive, some might be negative, doesn't matter. And so KVL says the sum of voltages around a loop is zero. So if I form a loop, and a loop, a loop is a closed path. It's not necessarily a closed circuit, right? It's a closed path. This is what I mean. Okay, so here's a closed path and 
a closed circuit. But around loop one, uh, let's write a KVL equation. What I do to minimize mistakes, and you can watch my review video on this on why I do this, but when I hit a minus, I put my, so I put my finger, my pencil, my mouse on the circuit, I trace around. When I hit a minus, I write a minus. When I hit a plus, I write a plus. So minus VA plus VB minus VC back to the starting point equals zero. Okay. So here's loop two, which you'll notice is a closed path, but it's not a closed circuit. I have a, an open here. That doesn't matter because I have a voltage VX defined across those open terminals. So here, starting at the upper right, plus VD minus VC minus VX equals zero. Okay. And you don't have to choose only inner loops. You can go around a circuit, any loop. Um, so this path would be minus VD plus VX minus VA plus VB equals zero. Okay. And, you know, even if, if you have a circuit and it has a couple voltages and a positive and negative voltages and their ground is connected together and you have a couple elements, sometimes it's tempting to not write a KVL equation. Sometimes it's tempting to just, well, you know, uh, just kind of eyeball it and guess a voltage. I recommend not doing that uh, if it's for score. I mean, you know, if it's for score on a test or if it's for score, like if you're wrong, you will blow out a circuit component. So it's worth... Uh, uh, it's worth writing a KVL equation. All right. Okay. And as I mentioned, I use the process when I hit a plus, write a plus. When I hit a minus, write a minus. Okay. So let's talk about voltage division and current division. So uh, voltage division is a way when you have series resistors, it's a way to calculate how voltage splits up among those series resistors or divides among those series resistors. And the pattern to that is this, right? If I want to find uh, the voltage across R1 right, of that series set, and I know the voltage across that series set, then the voltage across R1, V1, is Vs, right? the voltage across the series set, times this ratio on top goes the resistance across which you want to find the voltage. And then the denominator is the sum of all series resistances. And you'll see that pattern continue, right? Here, the equation for V2 uses R2 on top. Here, to find V3, put R3 on top. It's very useful. It should, this, this, um, uh, this pattern, voltage division shows up a lot, so it's worth memorizing that, recognizing that. You will actually use this in your project. So the voltage division approach principle is uh, useful for creating uh, reference voltages, adjustable reference voltages. So in, in your, let's see, on your DC to DC converter, no, not your DC to DC converter, it's your um, obstacle detector, your infrared obstacle detector with the emitter and the detector. The detector uses an op amp to compare what comes out of the detector element um, to a reference voltage. And that reference voltage is adjustable. That voltage is created by an op amp. So the screw on your, um, the sensitivity adjustment on your uh, infrared emitter detector, obstacle detector is a potentiometer, creating a reference voltage for one of the inputs of the op amp on that board, okay, oh, for that comparator. Okay, current division um, applies to parallel resistors. Current division is a way to calculate how current splits up among parallel resistances. So it looks a lot like um, uh, uh, voltage division, except you're using the reciprocals of the resistances. In other words, conductances, right? G, conductance equals one over R. So here, um, I1, the current through R1, is the current coming into that parallel set times this ratio. On top goes the reciprocal of the resistance through which you're trying to find the current. And then the denominator, you have the sum of the reciprocals of all the resistances of that parallel set. Okay, same thing for I2, right? Same thing for I3, you can see the pattern here. 
And so that's useful um, in many cases too, when you have parallel resistances. But that's great. You saw that in intro circuits. You might've seen that in physics, but let me show you a very practical application of, of voltage division, um, especially to a mechanical engineer. Let's talk about connector pin engagement and power sequencing. Often it is important to sequence power connected to a circuit in the right order um, or connect the pins of a connector in the right order because, and, and that often falls on mechanical engineers, right? To choose connectors for electrical interface, like these micro D connectors or these industrial um, circular connectors. Okay, so let's suppose you have a power supply circuit. That power supply circuit supplies two voltages with, ref, uh, with respect to ground, right? A 24 volt voltage and a five volt voltage that powers a circuit that needs those two voltages. Okay, and, and that circuit might look like this, right? It might be a more complicated circuit with active electronics, but let's just use a couple of resistors to demonstrate the point. So I haven't connected these connectors yet, but the load circuit um, has this resistor representing a real component, a different component that is 24 volts nominal. It wants to see 24 volts to be powered. This other resistor, this 1K resistor is five volt nominals nominal voltage. And let's suppose it, you know, it might be a circuit that, that can be damaged, just represented by a resistor, right? Maybe it behaves like a resistor, but it has voltage limits. And if you go below negative one volt or above six volts, you damage that, that component. Okay, so um, connector pins do not engage simultaneously, right? When you plug a connector in really fast, uh, there's still no simultaneity. So what is V1, this voltage across this vulnerable component, what is V1 if the ground connection engages last? In other words, you plug the connector together, I connect this, ter these terminals, I connect these terminals and ground is, is mated last, okay? Well, let's do this by solving first, what is um, this voltage here? Right? We're going to do that using Kirchhoff's voltage law, and then we're going to use voltage division to figure out what's the, the voltage across this R1 here and see if it, it's okay or if it's going to be damaged. Okay, so um, let's write that KVL equation first. So my green trace here starting at the dot, this is uh, my KVL path, my loop, minus 5 plus Vs, right? I jumped from one circuit, one point in the circuit, one node in the circuit to another node in the circuit. I'm defining Vs to be that voltage. That's fine to do, right? It's not a closed circuit, but it's a closed path. So minus five plus Vs, right? Through the closed connector, uh, plus 24 equals zero. So I get Vs equals minus 19 volts. Okay. And so, I have this, if I break this load out, here's what I have. I have an open at the ground, it's not connected yet. And I have negative 19 volts Vs with this polarity across these two resistors, which now clearly, right, appear in series. These, are, these resistors are in series because if you had a current going through R1, that same current would go through R2, okay? And so uh, I can use voltage division to calculate V1. V1 is Vs times R1 over R1 plus R2, right? And so I find that V1 equals minus 9.5 volts. So right, nowhere did I have negative 9.5 volt uh, as a power supply in, in this circuit. Uh, but when I plug that connector together, if the ground happens to connect last, then for, for a short amount of time, I have negative um, 9.5 volts across this component here that may damage it, right? So that's why uh, connector engagement order is sometimes important, right? And you have to determine from the electronics engineer if the order matters or if the sequencing matters, right? And, and, and how do you solve that? Well, there are mechanical approaches. You might have a ground pin in some connectors can be longer than the other pins. So you know it's going to engage first. There's electronic sequencing. You can build circuits that won't allow a voltage to be applied to a sub-circuit until another connection is made, right? You can do that electrically. 
But that's the practical example exercising KVL and voltage division in a practical way, not just a homework problem. Okay, do you switch the order and then no damage would occur? Well, you could if, if you actually, if you connect the ground first, right? If you connect the ground first um, in this particular circuit, then if the 24 volts uh, connection pin engages next, then you have 24 volts here across R2 and zero volts across R1. That may be okay. Again, check with the electronics engineer if order if sequencing matters. And then finally, the five volt connection is made, and then you have five volts across V1. So you know, in that order, ground 24 five that would be okay, or ground 5 24 that would be okay. Okay, in this particular case. There are, we're going to talk about MOSFETs. There are circuits that use what are called depletion mode MOSFETs that act like an open circuit unless you apply a negative voltage to the gate, right? So that's really bad if you have a power supply across that component. So you don't want the, the power supply to the MOSFET to power up before you apply the negative gate voltage because you'll blow out the component. So sometimes sequencing matters. We'll talk about MOSFETs later. Okay, Thevenin equivalent circuits, you probably covered these in a circuits class. And so it's actually very practical for many applications. I'm gonna change the vocabulary to common vocabulary, but I'll show you that. So any circuit, um, any linear circuit with resistors and sources can be modeled as a voltage source in series with a resistor, right? So that means if I connect something to A and B on the left, I connect that same thing to A and B on the right, right? Two different circuits, but the thing connected would not know the difference. Um, VT is the Thevenin voltage. Uh, RT is the Thevenin resistance. And so those are the names of these um, variables that we used in circuits class. Now, often the Thevenin resistance is often called output impedance, right? If you're talking to someone who has a source, a function generator, an RF, maybe an amplifier, they're, they're, they're never going to say Thevenin resistance, right? They're probably going to say output impedance. And impedance versus resistance, right? I, because impedance can be generally resistive or inductive or capacitive or all three. So output impedance covers each and a combination of all three. So you'll hear output impedance instead of Thevenin and resistance. And then oftentimes you'll hear open circuit voltage versus uh, Thevenin and voltage. Okay, so just a practical note there. So common applications of Thevenin and equivalents are to model some complicated circuit, right? Like some kind of RF amplifier or transmitter or a sensor uh, with a simple circuit for the purpose of understanding um, the output interface and and how to connect to it. What's going to happen when you do connect to it? Um, and it's also useful to determine a load resistance that results in maximum power transfer from a source to a load, like maybe a very low power sensor uh, to a load that is a data acquisition device, right? So you want to get the most power, so you get the, the most signal power, the sensor signal power, so you get the best signal to noise ratio, okay? And so, or um, instead of this theoretical linear circuit that you find in circuits class, um, there are practical devices, there's equipment that can be modeled using a Thevenin equivalent, like communications equipment that outputs signals, audio equipment, right, outputs audio signals, test equipment generates signals, okay? So, um, so let's look at an example, right? Just some equipment you're, you're going to use, in fact. So here is the Thevenin equivalent. It's a circuit or it's a, it's a real source. And right here's the load that you would connect to that real circuit or real source, okay? And so for maximum power transfer, um, RT equals RL. You set the, the load resistance equal to the Thevenin resistance. And uh, 
you know, we need to calculate RT to calculate VL, right? So if you have some kind of source with its output impedance specified, and you want to know what will what will the voltage be VL if I apply a certain resistance, then you have to know, right? You have to know um, what RT is. You have to know VT as well. Right, some practical examples. The function generator. This is a, a low, relatively low frequency, up to up to twenty megahertz function generator. Creates you know square waves, sine waves. Um, at its output channel, right here, uh, you see fifty ohms. That's its output impedance. So you can model this function generator as an AC source in series with a fifty ohm resistor. And here's a spectrum analyzer. This is high frequency. This is probably up to 1.5 gigahertz here. There's an output and an input. And um, the output generates sinusoids. And you'll see 50 ohms. That's its output impedance or Thevenin resistance. OK, here is an input. You'll see RF input 50 ohms. Uh, that means that this input looks like a 50 ohm resistor, right? There's lots of electronics behind this. There's probably an amplifier, an attenuator, something behind that. But it doesn't matter. From the outside world, if you apply a frequency within the range it's supposed to operate, right? If you, if you apply a voltage, uh, probably a sinusoid, it will look like a 50 ohm resistor. Okay, so that's that's how you simplify looking at this more complex equipment. If it's a source, they have an equivalent. If it's a if it's a, a sink or a load and it's like a real um, real impedance, then use a resistor. Okay, here's another signal generator with a 50 ohm output impedance you know, as an example. Here's a circuit. Here's an RF amplifier. And um, 50 ohm is common. A 50 ohm output impedance and input impedance and characteristic impedance is common for RF circuits. Uh, except for television RF, T like like over the air TV used 75 ohms, like cable TV used 75 ohms. I've yet to find a satisfying explanation for that. Um, and other equipment may have different output impedances. If you're in lab, if you if you have equipment that has a BNC connector like these or an SMA connector like this one here, it's probably 50 ohms. Okay, so. All right. All right. So here is a uh, here's an example a calculation example. Let's suppose um, you're trying to sample received radio signals from from well from an, an antenna and RF electronics, and you're using an analog to digital converter. An analog to digital converter. This is, would be a high rate one. Periodically samples an analog waveform, an analog voltage, and outputs digital values proportional to that voltage. Okay, we'll talk more about ADCs when we get to microcontrollers. ADCs have a full scale voltage above which, right, sampled signals become distorted or clipped, right? So if you go out of the ADC's voltage range, the signal's going to get distorted in, in the digital domain. So let's suppose you have, a, a, I'll say, a relatively complicated circuit. You have an antenna receiving RF signals, you have RF electronics, has amplifiers in there has filtering in there, um, and uh, it has this output, this voltage with respect to ground, that node voltage right there. And then you connect to that RF electronics output um, an analog to digital converter circuit that has a 50 ohm input impedance. Input Z means input impedance. Well, often I can, I can model with uh, this RF electronics circuit and the antenna as a uh, Thevenin equivalent. So I have some presumably cosine signal coming in on, on this cosine carrier. And I have um, an output impedance of often 50 ohms for RF equipment. And then I have a load, which is this ADC circuit. I'm just going to represent that circuit, which is very complicated. It has like, it probably has balans and, and, um, and uh, comparators and, you know, there's an amplifier in there, but to the outside world, it looks like a 50 ohm resistor. So we're going to use that. Okay. So as a practical example, suppose you were trying to determine the maximum power that can be received by an RF communications receiver. Okay. 
So this is your, you know, this is your RF communications receiver. It has an antenna, some RF electronics, and the ADC samples that voltage out of the RF electronics. If an ADC circuit, um, if an ADC circuit has a full scale range of one volt peak to peak, right? What is the maximum power that can be applied at the input to the ADC from the antenna and the RF electronics? So, right, I know this ADC has a one volt peak to peak full scale range. That's that's in the range of what you would expect for an ADC sampling RF signals. Um, so what's the maximum power average I, I can apply here and not compress, clip, distort the signal? Okay, so RF sources, let's work it. RF sources typically have an output impedance, which is a thevenin resistance of 50 ohms. Right, so that's this RT right here. RF loads typically have an input impedance, load resistance of 50 ohms. So let's work with those values for these resistors. So first, we're given a one volt peak to peak full scale range, just common for ADC. So you, you always wind up in the real world and homework converting between peak to peak voltage, peak voltage, and RMS voltage. Right? They all have their place. So first, we want to work with RMS. So let's first convert peak to peak to peak, wait, peak to peak voltage to peak voltage. So the peak voltage, which is the amplitude of the sine wave is peak to peak divided by two. So one divided by two is one half. That's the amplitude of the, the load voltage. That's this A sub L down here. And then the RMS value for that load voltage is the peak voltage or amplitude divided by root two. So I get this, right? 0.3536 volts. And now with those R, with that RMS voltage and knowing the load resistance, I can calculate the power. So power is VRMS squared over R, right? That number squared over 50, I get 2.5 milliwatts. So if the, if the power out of the RF electronics exceeds 2.5 milliwatts, then Right, I'm going to have problems. My signal is going to be distorted as represented in the signal processor um, or sampler. OK, and so uh, I'm going to introduce something we're going to talk more about later. But if you talk to anybody now about RF electronics and you talk about milliwatts, they're going to ask you, what's that value in dBm? Because RF electronics engineers and mechanical engineers I work with who work with RF electronics systems speak DBM. We'll talk more about this later. But uh, DBM is 10 log base 10 of power in milliwatts. So that would be 4 DBM. OK. All right. All right. So I'm um, happy to dig into this uh, more if you have any questions. I know we went through that uh, rapidly. But I, I think we're just reinforcing some of the fundamental concepts here. So this is the end of the review. And we'll get into some test equipment material next time. And so, uh, so here are the takeaways. So there are practical benefits um, for the knowledge of basic circuit theory across disciplines, resulting in better designs and less rework. So if you know something about connector engagement, you can avoid uh, a problem later. You can do a better design now. You can do less rework, right? Or less correction later. And you know you can identify problems. So you know if an electrical engineer is is making some decision, and you as a mechanical engineer see that that's going to affect weight. They're using a lot of toroids, right? You say, wait a minute, this is like a quadcopter that can only li lift like you know whatever eight ounces, and you have a you know six ounce toroid that's going to take up three quarters of the payload right so you can you can say hey how about we use a different approach air core inductor if you can fit it and understanding practical circuits 
issues, uh, aids in more effective system level meetings and design reviews. So when you're meeting as, as, a, as a combined group with all the engineering disciplines, um, doing maybe some conceptual design, conceptual review, or, or a detailed design review, right? Then having an understanding of, um, you know, maybe why there's so much metal in the enclosure and why there's so much shielding around um, certain parts of the circuit, right? Having an understanding of that can um, make meetings more, more effective. Okay. All right. So I have hit the wall on time. That's good because we, we finished up the review. So uh, to end the class, uh, take a look at Canvas for the upcoming assignments. You will perform lab two this week, so I will see you there. Homework two is also due, uh, is due this Friday, and, and lab one is due. So take a look at the lab one due time if you have not submitted that yet. Um, the review videos are posted, so if anything I talked about during the review or anything upcoming uh, you want more information on, see the See the videos, uh, review videos page on Canvas. I have short snippets, index uh, points into the, the, the circuits class if you want to refresh your memory there. Um, I will have office hours right after class, so just stick around on this Zoom session if you'd like to join. If not, I will see you next time. Have a great night.